everyone. So my name is Emery Johnson. I'm a public information officer with the Shovel Creek Fire. And here we are at Ken Kunkel Community Center going live for our community meeting. And we're going to start shortly. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to our Facebook Live uh, of the Shovel Creek Community Meeting. Um, so, uh, as in before, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and ask. We'll try to get them as many as possible. Uh, the meeting's going to begin with two minutes. So just stand tight. And uh, thank you again. All right, so we're just waiting here a couple more minutes, about two minutes until we start. So we've got Kate here with the borough live streaming on their page as well. Go check it out, live stream. We've got people filing in and uh, a public information officer, Mel, up front. <laughs> Doing great. <laughs> so if our connection um, breaks up live, we will be posting this after we conclude. And we'll also be uploading to YouTube. We'll be uploading to YouTube as well when we're done. So um, thanks for joining us. All right, it's 6 o'clock. We can go ahead and get started. I am Melanie Banton. I am a public information officer with the Northern Rockies IMT6. And uh, we'd like to thank you for having us here tonight and for showing up to hear what we have to say. A uh, couple of things before we get started. Silence your cell phones. I'll try to remember to tell you to turn it back on when you leave. Um, I'll, I'll be introducing our guests, and after they speak, uh, we'll have about a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session, and then after we close out, they will be available along with the rest of our team to uh, answer any questions you might have in further detail. So, with that, um, we have Mike Ottenweiler who's going to be our incident meteorologist. He's going to talk weather. We're going to have John Trapp, which is our fire behavior analyst. Uh, Fred Thompson will be talking fire operations. We've got David Gibbs, who's the director of emergency services for the borough. Jeremy Douse, which is the Fairbanks Delta area forester. He's going to be talking fire repair. And then Jay Winfield, our deputy incident commander, will summarize. So if you'll just hold any questions until they've all had a chance to speak, we'll have some time to, for that afterwards. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm incident meteorologist Mike Ottenweller. Um, so my role on the fire is to provide the weather information to the firefighters for the safety of the firefighters, the safety of the public, and basically get the forecast for exactly the fire area. Um, so I'm from the Anchorage National Weather Service office. I've been down there for about a decade now, uh, forecasting for South Central Alaska. I've made several trips up to the Fairbanks area to forecast here too. And then we have the convenience of our ICP being located about five miles from the Fairbanks National Weather Service. So it's really easy to tie in with those folks and coordinate our forecast. So my role um, is a day-to-day -day thing where I'm studying every bit of the weather pattern that I can. It's, uh, it's a really unique assignment for us when we get to do this because rather than forecasting for a gigantic area like you might see on the news we get to dial in to a very small piece of geography uh, you know this 22,000 acre or so fire and we get to figure out the local winds we get to figure out the local convection thunderstorms and all those things so it's actually quite an honor to get to do it and it's really enjoyable uh, as a meteorologist to get to come out and spend that much time doing a deep dive into weather. So a little history uh, for the weather on this specific fire. Um, so I'm the second incident meteorologist. The previous one was here with the last team. And it uh, started from lightning, as most of you probably know, on uh, June 21st with that lightning storm. And uh, that was at the start of a pattern for Alaska where we moved into fairly extreme high pressure. Um, the high pressure built up from Kodiak Island and kind of surged northward through the entirety of the state through the Alaska Range and over towards Fairbanks area. 
And with that, we saw days and days of uh, record high temperatures across South Central, some record high temperatures across the interior, and really on, on the order of about 10 degrees above normal high temperatures for an extended period, close to two weeks. So that brought us through the 4th of July and then into the middle portion of July. Um, most of you probably know Anchorage set its all-time record high at 90 degrees on July 4th, which broke the old record by 5 degrees. So that's pretty incredible to break a record of all time by 5 degrees. So that showed the strength of how warm and how dry that pattern was um, and allowed the fire to grow from its, from its initial start to the size that it got to. Um, so then a little bit more history on July 10th and 11th, that's when we had some more thunderstorms move through. Um, outflow winds, those kind of things, up to about 30 miles an hour impacted the fire area. And uh, thankfully those storms also had some precipitation. So most of you probably remember last Thursday night when that storm moved through and dumped the rain. The fire ended up getting almost an inch of rain that night across the entirety of the fire, which was very helpful for all of us and for the team out there. Um, and then on Friday into Saturday, we also saw those low clouds, the continued drizzle conditions very high relative humidity is only touching about 80% from the humidity during the day, which is, is very good recovery. And so with that, it would allow the team to kind of start to turn a corner and take a different approach um, with those weather conditions. So then we can move into kind of where we've been this week and where we're going. So this is one of the, one of the maps that we get to make, one of the graphs that we get to make for the firefighters and for the uh, incident management team on a daily basis. And so for this past week or so, you all probably know we've had some afternoon thunderstorms and thankfully those thunderstorms have been wet. Um, and by that we mean they generally produce about a tenth of an inch of precip. And so we've had some rain on the fire the last couple days. Some of those storms have missed the fire and we haven't had an overabundance of lightning. Uh, a few weeks ago we were getting about 22,000 strikes across the state, which again is, is very anomalously high. As of the last couple of days, we've only had about two to 4,000 strikes across the state. So not as much lightning, more rain with each of these systems. So the fire has gotten some rain even from these smaller cells over the past couple of days. We have not been in a weather pattern that was like early July for the past week, and we don't think we're going back into a weather pattern that was like early July going forward. And so what we're expecting really for the next couple of days is more of a westerly flow to set up across uh, the Tanana Valley and over to the Yukon Valley. And this, in, this uh, weather is coming from the northwestern portion of the state, the Bering Sea and the uh, Chukchi Sea, pushing down through the middle of the state. And so with that, westerly winds are going to increase, but our temperatures and our humidities, our uh, temperatures going down, humidity is going up. So both good pieces of good news for the fire. Um, those west winds will be something of interest to us because we haven't seen those for a while. So we'll be watching those closely. Uh, we do think they'll get gusty but we don't expect them to be too much of a problem because of the mitigating factors from the temperatures and the humidities. And as we go out a little bit farther, we do expect a warm-up into early next week. And again, this is not on the magnitude of the one that we saw, the record-breaking warm-up early this month, but it will warm up and it will dry out to start next week. And that could persist through about the middle of the week. And so we've been planning around that. This is a planning matrix, we call it. And we've been planning for those conditions to see how we can best use those to the advantage to accomplish all the goals that we have for the fire. And then, as you all know, forecasting weather in Alaska, trying to go beyond four days is a joke. You're not going to be able to get anything of reliability beyond about four days. It's extremely challenging to even sometimes get those four days right this time of year or in the wintertime. So going out farther, it gets really, really fuzzy, and the predictability gets really low. But it does look like we continue to stay somewhat warm, somewhat, somewhat dry, but a good chance for moisture to move in again next weekend. Um, this pattern doesn't look to set up for the two weeks like we saw in the early portion of July. I think that's all I have for you, and uh, I'll pass it off to Melanie. You're going to get the board ready for the next speaker with the new map. So um, while I have you for a minute, I'd just also like to point out that we have Chris Mache, which is the state forester, Tim Dabney, which is our deputy state forester, Paul Keach, regional forester, the Northern Regional Office, and Raphael Rodriguez is a resource uh, advisor. So whenever y'all come up with questions at the end of this, they'll also be available to talk to you. John? Hello, everyone. 
everyone. My name is John Trapp. I'm a fire behavior analyst um, from Montana. I've been fighting fire for 13 years. I was here in 2013 on the Steward 2 fire, right close to us, uh, fighting fire and doing structure protection, some of the things that we've been, the teams have been doing here. Um, so as a fire behavior analyst, what I focus on is looking at really specifically what what is the fire going to do in the next operational period so that can help uh, planning like when um, Fred comes up to talk about operations they're able to take that information and, and, and come up with tactics for the day and in doing so what what I focus on mostly is fuels which I'll talk about a little bit and of course weather which Mike just spoke about which feeds into the condition of and topography is also a factor that influences. So uh, under this map, and I'm sure Fred will probably talk about this map underneath a little bit, and you'll have a chance to look at that, um, is a similar map. This is a, the outside in the yellow here. You see uh, the perimeter of the fire. Um, so in the, in the process of trying to understand what the fire is going to do and how it's going to behave, uh, we, we take into a lot, a lot of input. The first thing we do is find the local expertise, which there's a lot of it around here. You have a lot of people that know what's going on, including probably a lot of you that have seen it a lot, right? So that's what I do is I figure out who are the people that are around us that have a lot of the answers. And a lot of these Alaskan uh, firefighters have a lot of good information. So I get that information, they give me clues where to look, where I can gather the data that's going to help us really understand what the fire is going to do. Um, because I've, I've been from Florida to Alaska, and it's different everywhere you go. So figuring out how it is here is my job. And so I start doing that. We look at a lot of different tools. We look at the weather data. We look at fuel moistures and the condition of the trees, the weather patterns. Um, one of the methods that we looked at recently was an IR image that helps kind of show, if you look out here, the darker areas of this map um, show primarily where the black spruce are, higher concentrations of the black spruce. And the lighter red on here shows either the clear areas or where there's aspen and birch. And what we've found as this fire has progressed over the last few weeks is that the fire obviously burns really well in the black spruce, the spruce, you all know that, right? But then, you know, depending on the conditions, when it starts to encounter those hardwoods, the aspen or the birch, it's going to depending on the condition of those fuels, it's either going to slow it down or stop it, or if things are really extreme, it'll just keep cooking right through the aspen and the birch, right? Luckily, we have not been uh, in that situation too much. Uh, we did have that severe drying period that Mike spoke about that did put things really at risk. But since our team has taken over the, the fire, we've seen some r relatively high humidities and the temperatures have been a little bit lower and that kind of keeps that fuel a little less receptive to spread and growth and so when you look at these maps and we have other ones that show fire prog progression how it's gone from day to day how, how far it advanced um, those are really tied to the weather for that day and the weather leading up to those days that affected those fuels right so um, that progression is very interesting as it's grown, and wind events have a big part of it. So, so again, that's the shape that you see here is, is dependent on the fuels, weather, and topography. So as we look forward, uh, Mike mentioned that we have a little bit of cooler uh, and some, uh, some little bit that uh, humidities are still fairly high. And what we've, we've found, we being, again, the local expertise that have been doing it for a long time, is that when you have many multiple days with the temperatures above 70 and your RH is below, your minimum RH is a relative humidity is below 30, that starts to dry that deeper duff layer that I know you're all familiar with when you go to walk through the, the tundra, right? And when you have multiple days of that, it dries that out and makes it susceptible to carrying the fire and helping to progress that fire. So we look really closely at that. What's the condition of that? And how is the weather over the next few days going to affect that and the, and the fire behavior? Is it going to get up in the trees? Is it going to move? 
Uh, where do we need to focus our resources based on that to try to maintain control as much as we can of the fire um, and uh, move forward there. So if you have more specific uh, questions on how fire, how I look at fire behavior, I'll be right here afterwards and be happy to answer any questions. Um, but those are some of the considerations that we look at. And I'll pass it off to, to Fred and Ops Operations. Okay, as has been stated before, my name is Fred Thompson, um, Operations Section Chief here. Uh, I've been in uh, a forward operator in wildland fire for nearly 30 years now. And I have extensive experience here in Alaska, not only in the interior, but uh, all over the state of Alaska. Uh, incidentally, I was a part of the initial attack uh, resources that went in on the Hastings fire. And they put in on that fire and chased the southern flank of that fire for 12 days. So I'm very intimately familiar with the area. And uh, I've been asked to come in here and give you guys sort of an update of where we're at and what we're doing. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start with uh, where we, we've got labeled now as the Vision Hotel and Mike, which is the uh, private property and cabins and inholdings within the river corridor there. Uh, we currently have uh, about 10 firefighters in here, uh, 60 pumps, and probably uh, upwards of 20 miles of hose and sprinkler systems set up in there and around those structures to protect those structures. They're in there right now, checking the system, making sure it's working. And the event that we have to insert some folks in there uh, if we get an un unanticipated uh, increase in fire behavior. Uh, over here in Mike, uh, those, there's uh, about 40 people in here uh, working around this piece of uh, line that you see right here. Some heat left in that, and they're just hooking it around the corner to reduce any risk of this fire moving that way. Uh, up, up on uh, the west side of the fire, we have two hotshot crews working uh, on this spot right here, uh, securing this. It's looking really good. And uh, we've been using the uh, IR drone to fly this area, looking for heat, uh, identify any areas of concern, and take care of the water in there. Uh, across the top here, there's about 20 people just patrolling this area, uh, looking for anything that is, was unseen or forecasted in there. Got 80 people right in this corner here. Uh, we're making really good progress. Again, we use the IR drones. Look at that. Um, and get that secured and reduce any risk of uh, that fire moving uh, back into and threatening the um, private communities in and around that area. Uh, another 60 people work in this line right here. Um, they're uh, way interior, taking care of any hot spots in there. And we're expecting an increase in containment uh, after shift today. Uh, we've got. Uh, probably 60 miles of hose out there that we're in the process of uh, removing as we finish using it. Um, things are going really well. Uh, good progress is steady. Uh, we seem to be uh, turning the corner on this fire for sure. Uh, feeling good about it. So, thank you. Hi, I'm David Gibbs, Emergency Services Director. Um, we spent a lot of time together in the last month, so I'll be really brief. Uh, just want to catch up on a couple things. Uh, first of all, the smoke respite center that we had at FMH is now closed as of 5 o'clock. We're ready to wrap it back up if it needs to be, but as you can see, the weather conditions are, uh, much and smoke conditions have improved greatly over the last couple weeks. Um, secondly, we'll be keeping the text messaging service active until the end of September. So hopefully we don't have to use it for any more fires this summer, but we'll keep it alive and keep it here active um, until September. And finally, I just wanted to um, Thank you all for your help, cooperation, the feedback we've got. We've got a lot of things that we need to work on, and um, we're going to be doing that over the course of the winter, and maybe even do an outreach of that here um, to talk to you about some of your experiences and things, some of the suggestions that you guys have made um, in the course of this fire. So with that, um, you know, we understand we need to improve, and, and we'll be working on that. So um, that's all I have to say. I'll be here uh, if you have any additional questions. So I'll turn it over to Jeremy Duss. Or Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jeremy Dallas. I am the area forester, the Fairbanks area forester for the Division of Forestry. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am relatively new to being the area forester, but I'm not new to 
being a forester in interior Alaska, then um, doing it to, for about 17 years, moved up here in 2002, and I've been working in forestry since. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the transition into fireland repair, which is kind of where we're moving. Like Fred said, they are still certainly working on hot spots, and, um, and there's firefighters out there still working. But while we have equipment out there, we're trying to get to transition to uh, repairing some of the fire line. Um, so I have a map up here. Um, and I know it might be hard to see in the back, but it'll certainly be around. So there'll be a few of us around that can answer questions about um, uh, what's going on out there. The hash marks delineate, these, these are kind of X marks delineate where dozer, bulldozers were used. And when we have bulldozers and slope, um, obviously water runs downhill and it, it funnels in those areas. So our goal is to try to repair those areas, get water off of them so that we're not experiencing a lot of erosion. Um, and the other thing that, that we're trying to do is any permafrost soils that were exposed, we want to cover those up as quickly as possible just so it doesn't subside and create issues. And then probably the biggest issue that um, affects all of us, we're all Alaskans and we like to play outside, is trails. So some of these those, those are lines, are, they use trails to, to punch these control lines in because they're good spots to, to work off of. Um, but our goal is to keep those trails, well, put them back into, into the condition that they were as much as possible so that they can be continued to be used as trails. And so what this map shows is some green lines, some red lines, some yellow lines, and then you all probably know about the um, Old Murphy Dome Road extension. So the green lines are uh, where our resource advisor, Raphael, had identified existing trails before. And um, so some of them, like the Seven Mile Trail, they did start using dozers down it, but then they did not, you know, they, they didn't continue on with that. So where the X marks are, are that's where we're focusing our repair. Um, but we want to turn it back into what it was. So basically a, a snow machine trail or dog mushroom trail or a DPD trail. And so all of these lines that you can see are where those trails exist. I know a lot of people probably use that fuel break that we put in some years ago. Um, I use that myself. So, so we want to turn the upper part of that back into the trail that it was. Uh, there is some erosion control issues that we want to take care of in there, but um, we're working through that and then just turn that upper part back into a trail. Um, so, and that just continues all the way out to, to uh, the McLeod subdivision. And then around the McLeod subdivision, there's a number of issues that we have that, that we witnessed or identified out there. There's existing trails. There's some area that doesn't have trails. There's permafrost that's been exposed. So we are coming up with a more specific plan just for that area, and we're still working through that. And we're still working through a lot of this, but that one we know that we're going to have to spend some more time on. So that's why it's delineated in yellow. These red lines were not trails before. These are dozer lines that firefighters use to try to control the fire. And um, they're not good locations for trails. Like this one is really steep, and it ends there at Murphy Creek. We don't want it to erode into that creek, so we're going to close it off um, and put in water bars and just so it doesn't erode down the hill. And the same thing out here on this little slop over part. We're going to try to control or try to control the erosion and close that off as much as possible. And then on the Murphy Dome Road extension, um, or the old Murphy Dome Road, that one is a public easement, um, so it was used as a secondary egress. Or the cloud, so if something happened, they could get out that way and go out to the Elliott Highway. Um, so it was brushed back and it was it was graded and made so that a two-wheel drive highway vehicle could cross it. And uh, I know a lot of people use that for dog mushing and for snow machining. And so our intent is for that to go back to what it once was. Uh, nobody's going to maintain it in road condition anymore because nobody's going to pay for that. Um, unless somebody wanted to do it out of kindness of their heart, I guess. But, but um, so, so all the alder, all the rootstock in that alder, that's going to start sprouting back up. 
um, and, and grow back in, and, and it'll, be a, it'll be a trail that it once was. And we do have a couple of issues, or not issues, but a couple of areas where we have to control some, getting some uh, water off of the road so we don't have road issues. But, but um, that's basically it. The only other thing I would say is this darker group of kind of light green area here, that's state forest, and um, we're, we're trying to maintain access into that. So there's a couple of areas that are new trail that are on a good grade. They didn't use a dozer in there. They used fallout bunchers, so the, the soil or the, the vegetative mat is still intact. I don't think there's any erosion issues. So we're going to maintain that. Um, I guess that's pretty much all that I have. Thank you, Jeremy. And I want to here to hopefully put this thing to bed for you and and allow you to get back into the woods and have a good time and and get on with your normal lives because what all of us on this team realize is fire affects everybody. So we want to minimize that and shorten that as quickly as we can. So quickly, I'll summarize a few things. Um, Weather-wise. You heard we're in a cooling trend through the weekend, then we're going to, going to dry, right? You also heard that um, John was talking about greater than 70 degrees and less than 30%. We have fire activity, okay, or significant potential. Well, then Fred got up here and talked about the fire operations. And looking at the veg layer map, we don't anticipate, we don't believe that we're going to see any significant movement on this fire. And I'll talk a little bit about that. David got up here and talked about communication and the importance of sharing information. I think that's really important, as I just stated. And then Jeremy was talking about repair. And we met this morning, several of us, to talk about what repair would really look like from an end state desirable end product for you folks, agency people, and all of us using that ground. So I think that's really important that we work together on this. We are all about building relationships, fostering relationships, and coming to a consensus on, on how we suppress and manage fires. So that's a real quick synopsis of what you just heard. Does anybody know nationally where we're at in terms of fire for the lower 48? Well, obviously, Alaska is the big game in town, right? Everything's going on in Alaska. So nationally, there's 92 large fires, okay? Well, in Alaska, 66 of those 92 are here in Alaska. So that gives you a pretty good idea. And then historically, the last 10-year average for fires from July 18th, 10 years ago, they averaged the number of fires, and typically were around 34 to 35,000 fires. Anybody got a guess where we're at this year? Well, not quite. It may seem like that in Alaska, but nationally, we're low. We're we're around 23,000 fires, okay? I will say over 1.6 billion million acres have burned here in Alaska. So folks in Alaska have been experiencing fires and smoke for quite some time this summer, and you're busy. So I just I wanted to share that information with you because I think it is important. We know that it depends on drying and weather and we all heard about that, and you guys are certainly at the top of the list in terms of work activity. So I'll sum up real quick what our next steps are. And the information you heard tonight, we use in a projection strategy where a lot of team members get together, we share information, we talk about what our projections look like. Some people refer to them as glide paths. But basically what we're doing is we're planning several days out and anticipating how much work or accomplishments we can get done depending on the available resources. So the bottom line is really we have 
heat and most of the perimeter of this fire. But our bottom line is we want to hold and secure this little pooch out on the west side. We're also concerned about the structures up here. So we, Fred talked about 20 miles of hose. You know how many feet that is? That's a lot, over 100,000, right? So at some point in time, we also know that's got to come out of there. But our first, our first goal in the next couple of days is to secure this, secure any of the heat around here that's near the perimeter, work along these flanks in Zulu, and try and secure and button up this little point here in Division Mike. We anticipate that's going to take two to four days, roughly. Okay, so once that's done, then we have all this hose to deal with, but we need that hose because we need to mop it up. So securing the line means what? Keeping the fire from spreading, right? We, we have a line around it. Not necessarily containment, but we have a line there, or we've cold trailed it. So we anticipate it not spreading out of the perimeter. So then we use the water and tools and crews to mop it up. And that's going to vary depending on the potential of the fuel inside that is burnt or unburnt and the potential of the fuel outside. So really, we're talking about securing and holding, mopping up the perimeter, and then we have the chore of what? Retrieving all the hose and pumps that you heard about. Okay. We anticipate, based on the numbers of pumps and number of miles of hose, that we are talking around seven full days of work trying to get that out of there. So that's really where our focus is, and those are our next steps. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay. Well, again, thanks for your participation. Everybody will be available at the end of this. And again, my name is Jay Winfield. I'm the Deputy Incident Commander. And we will entertain any questions you may have. So thank you. All right, that concludes the speaking portion. Um, just a few uh, reminders. Uh, turn your cell phones back on whenever we get done. Don't go home without that. And um, also, uh, you can still get daily information from the fire information of Shovel, Shovel Creek Fire Facebook page. We're also still continuing to update all of the trap lines and the boards that, that we've been putting out um, since the fire started. So uh, with that, does anybody have any questions for any of our speakers so far? Cost. That's a question on cost. Five hundred thousand. That's all. It was more earlier. It's about twenty million to date. Twenty one. Twenty one. Twenty one. State of Alaska. It's uh, all state-owned land, and so it's general fund money. Uh, we do have an FMAG, which is a, a grant from the federal government that will cover seventy-five percent of that cost. So the state will re be reimbursed for about 75%. Okay, so he said the state of Alaska is paying for that at this point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on the parallel, if somebody has carried a cloud subdivision, how can I be informed about what's going on with that? Repair work at the cloud subdivision. How does he get that information? I mean, you can leave your name and number with us or how to contact you. I mean, it's going to take a little while to come up with that plan. But, yeah. So, yeah, if you can give us your contact information, we can get back to you. Further questions? Yes, sir. I guess I should ask when he was up here about, uh, about the, what's the criteria when they pull the hoses? Criteria when they pull the hoses. Pull the hose out of there when the threat of fire uh, is gone. So uh, they're currently working uh, towards a 300-foot general 
uh, spec. They have 300 feet of coal black inside, inside the interior. Uh, there are some areas where firefighter exposure uh, and the necessity of that work isn't there. There will be a little less than that. But our general spec is 300 feet uh, around most of the perimeter. And then as far as the um, areas th that have the homes in the river canyon there, uh, we'll pull that out when the risk of this fire threatening those is uh, slim to nothing. Did I answer your question? Oh, did you want to ask a clar clarifying question? Else? All right, well, thank you. This will, this will close out the, uh, the formal portion, and we'll hang around. If you guys have any one on one that you would like to speak with any of our speakers out, uh, we'll be available for you. Thank you very much for showing up. We appreciate it. Have a good night. Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. So this is the conclusion of the Shovel Creek Fire Community Meeting. Thanks for joining us. Um, we have everybody breaking out around us so that way they can ask specific questions. And thanks for tuning in to the Alaska Division of Forestry. Our IMET here and we're signing out. Thanks for joining us.